from the Wigwam in Phoenix, Arizona. It's the Cube covering Data Platforms 2017. Brought to you by Cubeball. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. Welcome back to Data Platforms 2017 at the historic Wigwam Resort just outside of Phoenix, Arizona. I'm here all day with George Gilbert from Wikibon, and we're excited to be joined by our next guest. He's Mick Bass, the CEO of 47 Lining. Mick, welcome. Welcome, thanks uh, for having me, yes. Absolutely, so what is 47 Lining for people that aren't familiar? Well, you know, every cloud has a silver lining, and if you look at the periodic table, 47 is the atomic number for silver. So, we're a consulting services company that helps customers build out data platforms and ongoing data processes and data machines in Amazon Web Services, and one of the primary use cases that we help customers with is to establish data lakes in Amazon Web Services to help them answer some of their most valuable business questions. So, so there's always this, this question about you know, own versus buy, right, with, mm -hmm. with cloud and Amazon mm -hmm, specifically. Mm -hmm. And with a data lake, the perception, right, that's huge, this giant cost. Clearly there's some benefits that come with putting your data lake in AWS versus having it on-prem. What are some of the, the things you take customers through in kind of the scenario planning and the value planning? Well, just a couple of the really important aspects. One is this notion of uh, elastic and on-demand pricing. Uh, in a cloud-based data lake, you can start out with actually a very um, small infrastructure footprint that's focused on maybe just one or two business use cases. Uh, you can pay only for the data that you need to get your data lake bootstrapped and uh, uh, demonstrate the business benefit from one of those use cases, but then it's very easy to scale that up right, in a pay-as-you-go right. kind of a way. Um, the second uh, you know, really important benefit that <clears throat> customers experience in a platform that's built on AWS is the breadth of the tools and capabilities that they can bring to bear uh, for their predictive analytics and descriptive analytics and streaming kinds of data problems. So you need Spark, you can have it. You need Hive, you can have it. You need a high performance, close to the metal data warehouse on a cluster database, you can have it. Um, so analysts are really empowered through this, this approach because they can choose the right tool for the right job and reduce the time to business benefit based on what their business owners are asking them for. You, you touched on something really interesting, which was, so when a customer is on-prem, and let's say is evaluating Cloudera, MapR, Hortonworks, um, there's a, a finite set of services or, or, or software components within that distro. Well, once they're on the cloud, there's a thousand times more that, you know, as you were saying, you could have one of 27 different um, data warehouse products. You know, you could have many different NoSQL products, some of which are, you know, really delivered as services. Mm -hmm. What, how does the consideration of the, of the customer's choice change when they go to the cloud? Well, I think that what they find is that it's much more tenable to take an agile iterative process where they're trying to align the, the outgoing you know, costs of uh, the data lake build, to keep that into alignment with the business benefits that, that, that come from it. And so, if, uh, if you recognize the need for a particular uh, uh, kind of analytics approach, but you're not going to need that you know, until down the road two or three quarters from now. It's easy to get started with um, simple use cases and then like add those incremental uh, services as the, as the need manifests. One of the things that I mentioned in my talk that I always encourage our customers to keep in mind is that a data lake is it's more than just a technology construct. It's not just an analysis set of machinery. It's really a business construct. Your data lake has a profit and loss statement and the way that you interact with your business owners to identify the specific value sources that you're going to make pop for your company can be made to align with the cost footprint as you build your data lake out. So I'm curious, when you're taking customers through the journey to start kind of thinking of the data lake in AWS, are there any specific kind of application spaces or vertical spaces where you have pretty high confidence that you can secure an early and relatively easy win to help them you know, kind of move down the road. Absolutely, so you know, many of our customers in a very common you know, business need is to enhance 
the set of information that they have available for a 360 degree view of the customer. In many cases, you know, this, inf this information and data, it's available in different parts of the enterprises, but it might be siloed, and a data lake approach in AWS really helps you to pull it together in an agile fashion based on particular you know, uh, uh, quarter by quarter uh, objectives or capabilities that you're trying to respond to. Uh, another very common example is uh, predictive analytics for things like fraud detection uh, or uh, mechanical failure. Um, so in you know, e-commerce kinds of situations, uh, being able to uh, pull together semi-structured information that might be coming from web servers or logs or like what cookies are associated with, the, you know, with this particular user, um, it's, uh, uh, it's very easy to uh, pull together a, a, a fraud-oriented predictive analytic. And then the third area that is uh, uh, very common is uh, Internet of Things use cases. Many enterprises are augmenting their existing data warehouse with uh, sensor-oriented time series data, and there's really no place in the enterprise for that data currently to land. So are they, when you say they're augmenting the data warehouse, are they putting in the data warehouse, or are they putting it in a sort of adjunct time series database that from which they can sort of curate aggregates and things like that to put in the it's, data warehouse. It's very much the latter, right? And, yeah. um, uh, and the time series data itself may come from you know, multiple different vendors and uh, the, the input formats you know, in, in which that information lands can, can be pretty diverse. And so uh, it's not really a good fit for a typical kind of data warehouse uh, ingest or intake process. So, um, if you were to look at sort of maturity models for the different use cases, where would we be? You know, like IoT, customer 360, fraud, things like that. I think, you know, so many customers uh, have pretty rich uh, fraud analytics capabilities, uh, but some of the pain points that we hear is that it's difficult for them to access uh, the most recent technologies. In some cases, the, uh, the order management systems that those analytics are running on are quite old. We just finished um, some work with a customer where literally the order management system's running on a mainframe, even today. Um, and uh, those systems have the ability to accept steer from like a sidecar decision support predictive analytics system. And one of the things that's really cool about the cloud is you could build a custom API um, just for that fraud analytics use case so that you can inject exactly the right information that makes it super cheap and easy for the ops team that's running that mainframe to consume the fraud improvement decision signal that you're offering. Interesting. And so this is diving in the weeds a little bit, but if you've got an order, order management system that's decades old um, and you're going to plug in uh, something that has to meet some stringent performance requirements, um, how do you sort of test? It's not just the end-to-end -end performance once, but you know, for the 99th percentile that someone doesn't get locked out for five minutes while he's trying to finish his shopping cart. Exactly, and I mean, I think this is what is important about the concept of building data machines in the cloud. Uh, this is not like a once and done kind of process. You're not building an analytic that like produces a printout that an executive is going to look at and <laughs> make a decision. You're, <laughs> you're really uh, creating uh, a, a process that runs at consumer scale and you're going to apply all of the same kinds of uh, metrics of you know, percentile performance uh, that you would apply in any kind of large scale consumer delivery system. Do you, um, do you custom build, a, let's say, a fraud prevention application for each customer? Or is there a template and then some, uh, I guess some additional um, capabilities that you learn by running through their training data? Well, I think Largely, um, there are business by business uh, distinctions uh, in the approach that, um, that these customers take to fraud detection. There's, there's also business by business direction and uh, a distinction in their current state. So, uh, but what we find is that the commonality is in the kinds of patterns and approaches that you, that you tend to apply. So, you know, we may have uh, 
extra data about you based on your behavior uh, on the web and uh, your behavior on a mobile app, um, the particulars of that data might be different for enterprise A versus enterprise B, but this pattern of joining up mobile data plus web data plus um, uh, maybe uh, uh, phone in call center data, putting those all together um, to increase the signal that can be uh, made available to a, a fraud prevention algorithm, that's very common across all enterprises. And so um, one of the roles that we play is to set up the, the platform so that it's really easy to mobilize each of these data sources. So in many cases, it's the customer's data scientist that's saying, I think I know how to do a better job for my business. I just need to be unleashed to be able to access this data. And if I'm blocked, I need a platform where the answer that I get back is, oh, you could have that like second quarter of 2019. Uh, you know, instead, you want to say, oh, we can uh, onboard that data in an agile fashion, pay an incremental a little bit of money because you've identified a specific benefit that could be made available by, by having that data. Uh. All right, Mick, well thanks for stopping by. I'm going to send Andy Jassy a note that we found the silver lining to the cloud. <laughs> uh, so I'm excited for that. If nothing else, uh, that made the trip well worthwhile. So thanks for taking a few minutes. You bet, thanks right. so much guys. All right, Mick thanks, Bass, man. George Gilbert, Jeff Rick, you're watching theCUBE from Data Platforms 2017. We'll be right back after this short break. Thanks for watching.